This week in the parish of bourses and market structure, Texas Stock Exchange breaks cover as IOSCO publish final recommendations on tech outages. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler welcomes multiple fixed income clearing houses while battling legal setbacks elsewhere. And FASI appoints a fabulous new Director General while im Abendrot, Theodore Weimer finally breaks out of the box. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, episode 249. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction in highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the many events and happenings from the past seven days can be found at Exchange Invest Daily Subscriber Newsletter, the unique guide to the Boas business sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. This week in bid carnage, we were pondering the strictly mnemonic. I say that because I read the SEC were shuttering their Salt Lake office in Utah and immediately presumed there were statistics inferring crime in Mormon majority areas is now insufficient to justify the presence. So therefore it had become apparent it was all related, actually, to a conspicuous SEC failure. The SEC are shuttering their office behind the failed debt box crypto lawsuit, namely the Salt Lake office, after losing $1.8 million in that lawsuit. And thus, the smallest SEC office has met its demise. At the same time, there was a kind of T plus one R revolution going on. Gosh, there was the Trumpy one seemingly storming to victory, and now he opens his mouth and endangers the financial system just after a big fundraiser with lots of crypto folk. Would that be a coincidence? Donald Trump vows to be the crypto president, belledges to end Biden Gensler crypto policies within one hour. Good grief, ladies and gentlemen, the excitement of it all. If you enjoyed this excerpt, you may be interested to know you can read BitCarnage every day on Exchange Invest. Alternatively, if you want to follow BitCarnage, the daily update on happenings in the world of crypto and digital assets, as a standalone, you can find it on Substack. This week in Exchanges, the Financial Times had a ranting headline, German Coalition Attacks Beer Tent Style Speech by Deutsche Börse Chief. First up, I have to say, I don't think the sort of middle-class folks who write for the Financial Times have ever been the beer tent, let alone one where there's been a political speech happening in a heightened fiasco. But anyway, whether or not that was a heightened fiasco or a heightened farrago, ladies and gentlemen, well, we were pondering something along the lines of the end of the Weimar Republic. I mean, as perhaps the dullest CEO in the field and a nonetheless fairly competitive enterprise amongst various bourses, Theodor Weimar has never made headlines. He's never done anything interesting in his six years as CEO and indeed he's been so infrequently seen outside of the Taunus that has led to Paris jokes that he is to Frankfurt what Terry Duffy is to Chicago, embedded and rarely seen beyond the city walls. However, Ted Orfheimer has finally said something. What's more, he actually happened to be spot on. All the more reason to view as dafty daft de Lulu the reaction of the German establishment, who were clearly gutted that a man channeling impeccably grey thinking and words until recently has broken out of the box in frustration to point out the folly of modern Germany and the European Union. The question is not really what Theodor Weimar said or how he said it. The real politic is that in having a collective breakdown in the wake of TW's remarks, the political classes have shown that they are supremely devoid of ability, character, concept and vision to see that when even this entrenched Mr. Uber corporate, the epitome of grey business as usual, is shouting fire, the inferno is already raging out of control. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, no fire raging out of control, but certainly there's going to be something happening next time there's a typhoon, apparently. It looks like by September, electronic markets, aka the Hong Kong Exchanges Group's markets, will be allowed to happen, no matter what the weather. I suppose we could recall that PLY meteorological one-liner. The trouble with weather forecasting is that it's right too often for us to ignore it and wrong too often for us to rely on it. Soon, regardless of the weather forecasts, we'll be confident Hong Kong exchanges are open. Hooray! Over in Poland, the Warsaw Stock Exchange operator, they want to address the revitalization of the new Connect market this year. The Warsaw Stock Market's 
New Connect, their small business platform, SME platform, had an incredible birth, but then suffered on two fronts. Management, for example, Ludwig Sobolevsky, before he was felled by the curse of the pharaohs, preferred understandably large listings, even somewhat disdaining the smallest of New Connect offerings. I thought that was a little bit of a misnomer. In fact, I thought the small listings were a vast strength in terms of Wall Street Main Street of GPW at the time. The market memorably welcomed a $2 billion privatisation IPO in the same month as a local bond was valued at sub-200,000 Polish swati. That's under $50,000. More recently, the Polish problem has been growth in VCs across the Polish startup firmament who've aspired to punt companies straight to the USA. Whether in IPOs or trade sales, it mattered not. New Connect needs to find a new way, a third way. It's out there. I hope they can achieve it. Meanwhile, the worry warts have got on to something else now. They're having fretted over T plus one, which actually worked perfectly. We'll get onto that in just a second. The desire of the buy side and sell side to defray, delay, if not downright avoid central man- clearing mandates remains unabashed. The latest one is Wall Street frets over the timeline for centralised treasury clearing, according to Reuters. You know, some of us, we've been around since the 1990s, even the 1980s, when we were arguing the system needed to be safer with CCP on everything we could possibly de-risk. Unfortunately, the buy and the sell side, they keep wanting to say, well, not right now. One thing that has happened right now, this month, is that transition to T plus one. It took place actually at the end of May, and the smooth T plus one transition has cut the market default buffer by $3.1 billion. That's a hefty amount of collateral in its own right and represents a roughly 25% reduction in collateral for US stock clearing per day from T plus two. Fabulous news all round. Well done all those who are involved. As ever, the rest of the news was made up of plaint of woes of the Irish Stock Exchange crying for support, the London Stock Exchange not crying for support, but actually everybody around it realising that it has a fundamental problem and much more. You could get all those stories in Exchange Invest, the daily newsletter of the Bourse Business, the Exchange of Information. If you want to be at the Bourse Business water cooler, then consider subscribing. $375 per annum will give you a seven-day free trial if you sign up today, and you can get that from exchangeinvest.com. Over new markets, well, lots of excitement about the Texas Stock Exchange. A Texas Stock Exchange is looking to break into the southern southeastern quadrant of the USA. It's very interesting and not before time in many respects. But how do you break into that country club duopoly to create listings? Smaller thresholds? It's very interesting all the same. At the same time, of course, one could say that a lot of this could be a two-pronged approach to the largest investors are Citadel and BlackRock. For one thing, Citadel hopes to find another payment for order flow income stream, and that may be related to the ETF point, because BlackRock being a huge investor, clearly I would have thought their game is to try and get the listings fees down hugely for ETFs, and given the fact that they've got at least 433 ETFs of their own listed in the USA right now, Gosh, that could be a huge money saver, particularly if they could get the prices down to the sort of level that has been the case of the bargain basement competition between Dublin, Luxembourg, Vienna and other companies such as the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, who were even more desperate in their fee structure before they were closed down in recent months. In that sense, both these big name investors may not need a sustainable, successful TXSE over the long term, as has often been the case with competitive upstarts. They're seeking to keep exchange fees low, add a bullet to the head of the established operators so that they can't increase their costs. So long as Citadel and BlackRock see a decent return on their investment, we can't see whether the Texas Stock Exchange is going to last for the long term. If you want to understand more of these ramifications, You won't find them in the general media. You'll find them in Exchange Invest. Don't forget to sign up via exchangeinvest.com. It was a busy week for deals in the parish. One interesting snippet I'm going to give you there. Data provider Prequin, they are exploring a $1 billion sale. Allegedly, London Stock Exchange S&P are amongst the bidders for it, according to sources speaking to Reuters. It's an interesting deal that could have ramifications for the broadly moribund TPI cap as well, because they, of course, have a huge data subsidiary, which is the bit that actually has fundamentally most value in it right now, as opposed to the markets division. A sale of Prequin at a reasonable premium might excite investors to buy those TPI cap data assets, which were being shopped around last year most recently, but without a successful sale. If you want to understand why people will be shopping their data assets in this huge big data world, you ought to consider getting a copy of my most recent book, Victor of Death, Blockchain Cryptocurrency in the Fintech World. It is published by DV Books and Victor of Death is distributed by Ingram Worldwide.
Don't forget, while you're waiting for your copy of Victory or Death to arrive, check out our live stream Tuesdays, 5 o'clock London time, midday New York time. It's the IPO Vid Live Show. Catch the back episodes on LinkedIn and YouTube by searching IPO-Vid. The next show is looking to be an absolute corking, exciting, incredibly mega episode, which will be truly, truly epic from all possible senses, like everyone that we've had in the canon of episodes. I would look forward to you listening there. Our finance book of the week this week, incidentally, huge thanks to Paul Kahn for his recommendation of this week's book of the week, which is Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with AI by Ethan Mollock which shows what it means to think and work together with smart machines and why it's imperative that we master that skill. That book of the week was in last week's Exchange Invest Weekend. EI Weekend is a completely free publication, separate from Exchange Invest, the Daily Bulletin. It's free, you can sign up to it at exchangeinvest.com. And last week was, in fact, an all-time classic all about AI, our second special in the series. This week's Book of the Week will be announced on Saturday in the latest episode of the EI Weekly series. Over in product news, China is planning higher transaction fees for high-frequency trading. MSCI say South Korea's short-selling accessibility is deteriorating the market. And in Canada, the Canadian Derivatives Clearing Corporation announced the launch of a secured general collateral notes program. In other words, it's time to say bye-bye, Bax, baby. Swept away with the death of LIBOR. In technology news this week, IOSCO published their final report on market outages with a series of good practices to improve trading venues' resilience in the case of market outages. At the same time, over in the Colombo Stock Exchange in Sri Lanka, they made the great leap forward to T plus 2. Only one day behind 60.5% of the world's markets in the USA, notwithstanding also China, Mexico, India and indeed Russia as amongst others. In regulation, there was a lot of talk about how the Gensler SEC keeps losing court cases. That was slightly masked by the fact that Gary Gensler was celebrating the 90th anniversary of the SEC. He was talking about the era's tour of the Securities and Exchange Commission with a hat tip to the great billionaires. Of course, the one and only songstress Taylor Swift. Anyway, new SEC rules on private funds have been thrown out by US Appeals Court judge recently. The SEC Investor Protection Rule has been vacated as well by a judge. The SEC suffered another series of legal defeats, but it's not all one-way traffic. The key is to ensure the baby bathwater repo doesn't confuse what was a staggeringly overambitious program of expansion beyond the letter and spirit of the SEC's finding laws and the sensible work being done to try and preclude rampant criminality, although one might argue that has already happened anyway, in crypto. The Gensler moves on crypto have been coherent, but he's been dragging the agency into dubious ground way, way, way beyond the original, beautiful, narrow aims of the Securities and Exchanges Act of the 1930s, which set up the precepts for the SEC. Elsewhere, the CFTC, they've opened up a discussion this week. They're looking at proposed rules for events contracts. The proposed rules essentially being no, never, 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 never. That's not terribly helpful, but we live in hope. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome wherever you find this podcast. Career Path This Week fabulous news. We have a new Director General of FESE, the European Federation of Securities Exchanges. Fabulous news altogether from Brussels. As the wonks were digesting the Euro parliamentary elections, the exchange parish was elated. The wise board of FESE have opted to elevate Rosa Armes de Playa to head the highly effective Brussels exchange lobbying group. It's great to see a second woman heading the organisation, Judith Hart, Director General, having first employed Rosa in 2007. You can actually catch Rosa on both my live stream, IPO vid number 47, Capital Markets from Brussels with Love, as well as PhD 59. That's my wife's positivity hacks dis- delivered from a woman on it. How can women on IT grow a career in finance? FASI has led the debate with aplomb for years in the parish and remains the most effective of all the Securities Exchange Federations, along with each CCP and AFM, 
one of the three most effective parish federations of all in market structure. Let's face it, a fair few make The Walking Dead look vital, but that's not to detract from the brilliance of FaZe each and AFM. I'm genuinely delighted to see how Rosa moves FaZe forward, and of course, as Exchange Invest, and indeed individually Patrick L. Young, builder of markets, we're delighted to support our endeavours and those of FaZe as always. Congratulations incidentally as a footnote, FaZe's membership now covers a footprint of all 27 countries of the European Union, with Bratislava, Slovakia joining. Or if my memory serves me correctly, actually rejoining. But anyway, whichever it is, all of the European Union roadmap, each individual nation's securities markets are now within phase A. Let's hope that phase A can manage to do its level best and make progress to ensure the next European Commission is an effective one, which seeks to reboot the European Union's flagging economy, and who knows, even delivers something that is worthy of the name of Capital Markets Union. Fascinating move finally in career path this week. LSEG has appointed Pascal Boya as COO. Fascinating altogether because the new Chief Operating Officer of the LSEG, the London Stock Exchange Group, remember, is going to be based in New York, where his predecessor was based in London. So essentially, Refinitiv continues to own the LSEG management with, out of his depth, Dave, the CEO of the group, a passenger atop the jaunty ship. Previous CEO had been David Shoulders. He was London-based and it was announced he was heading to a UK insurance firm, Howden, in February. And that leaves us with one fascinating snippet for the end of the week. It's not so much in Big World as in Big Door this week. An elevator door from the long since destroyed, what an act of vandalism that was, Chicago Stock Exchange building has sold at Christie's Auction House for a pretty stunning $69,300, comfortably in excess of the $15,000 to $20,000 estimate. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to this Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast number 249. Join us daily via exchangeinvest.com or if you have a new market and exchange you'd like to get built, get in touch. My name is Patrick L. Young and I wish you all a great week in life and markets. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.